There's things that have been going on in your life and they've been dragging on for month after month after month. For some of you, it's been year after year. And the answer is not looking at the problem. And that's what I believe the Lord has been saying this morning. The answer is not looking at the problem because the more you look at the problem, the more you'll magnify that problem. The answer is to praise Him in spite of that problem. Not because of the problem. You don't praise Him because of the problem. You praise Him in spite of it. To say, God, you are so good. You're going to get me through this. You're going to get me through this. This is nothing to you. When you start doing that, you start agreeing with Him. And suddenly you come into the presence. You know, there's been thousands upon thousands of people that have received breakthrough healings and, and financial breakthroughs just through praise, just through worshipping God. But so many, so many believers just want to whine and complain and keep rehearsing the problem. The answer is not in the problem. The answer is in Jesus. Amen. And so, you know, I'm, I'm just reminded of a, of a lady and she'd, she'd been diagnosed with cancer and uh, she was believing God for a healing. They recommended chemotherapy, so she took chemotherapy and she, she also applied her faith with that and she was totally restored, cancer-free. And it was, about, uh, 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 it was around about six months later all these things started going wrong in her body and she didn't know what was going on. She went, got rushed to the hospital. She was in tremendous pain and they had a look and they did all these tests and what had happened was she didn't have cancer again. It was the chemotherapy had destroyed all her organs. They had corrupted and, be, and had just begun to fall apart, melt. And there was nothing the doctors could do. And so she was sent home with the strongest pain medication just told well you know this is your lot in life you it's eventually it's going to take you out these organs are failing and she and she began to look to the lord and he began to uh minister to her and eventually she came to a place where she was beginning to praise him praise him and praise him and praise him and one day she was praising and worshiping and just totally lost in his presence and the lord said to her have you realized what's happened and she said what's happened and the Lord said, check your body. And she was totally pain-free. And she didn't know when it had gone. She just got lost in praise and she was completely healed. And she's never had pain again. Now that could be repeated thousands upon thousands of times. There's power in it. It's not in rehearsing the problem. It's in looking at Jesus. Do I hear an amen? Hallelujah. Open yourself up. I believe others have a word from the Lord. If you're getting something from the Lord, a picture or a scripture... Come out, come and share it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, uh, Joel, this is for you. Um, I felt that while you were playing the drums, I, I felt it in my heart, like, like it brought me to be with the Lord. And um, I heard him say, Joel, you're playing to the heartbeat of God. You're playing to his heartbeat. Praise the Lord. Amen. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's see Matthew chapter 11. Hallelujah. Verse 29. God's given me a word for myself and also for a number of you here. And you know who it is when you hear it. God said, don't be a man pleaser. Be a God pleaser. This world has thrown a lot of stuff at people this last five years. And the more we struggle and strive and fight to try and be worldly, to chase things like finances and, and look at the medical profession for the answers, the answers aren't there. The answers are in Him. Be a God seeker. Yes. Go to please Him. Don't please man. That's a dead end. Think eternally. Think about eternity. We're only here for but a wisp of time. 
God says, chase me and I will let you catch me. Awesome. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's spot on, Pete. Hey, that today's message is very much revolved around that. Praise the Lord. Scripture from Isaiah 26, 3 and 4, and it says, you will, keep in, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is the eternal rock. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, team. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, we are living in exciting times. Well, Pete agrees anyway. I said we're living in exciting times. We are preparing for the return of the King. The King is on the return. Hallelujah. And we are privileged. I believe we'll be the generation that will see His return. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Um. Well, we're going to receive the tithes and offerings, and um, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Hallelujah. Verse 1, give me an oivy there. It says, After these things Jesus went out over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him, because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. And Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. You know, one denarii was about a, a, a day's wage. And so you could say two hundred denarii is, is around about ten months' wage. So it gives you an idea. It's, it's looking at probably forty to sixty thousand dollars. So Philip is saying, look, even 40 grand worth of Big Macs is not going to be enough for these people, you know. And so um, verse 8, it says, One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the people sit down. And there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number, about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to his disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. They had a little boy's lunch, and from that, he multiplied it supernaturally, that there was sufficient to feed 5,000 men, besides there were women and children, I mean, The estimates are there somewhere, 10,000 upward people that were being fed on this day with a a little boy's lunch. When Philip had said, man, even if we had 40 grand, we couldn't buy enough for these people. It says in verse 12, when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. And therefore they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left by those who had eaten. And, and those men, uh, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, truly, this is the prophet who is to come into the world. You know, if we are preparing for the return of the king, and I truly believe we are, then we need to be prepared. And one of the things we need to understand is we need to understand how the kingdom of heaven, how uh, heaven's economy works. Because as we approach the return of the king, there are going to be some issues and some problems. Things are going to go wrong. Now, that's nothing to be fearful of as believers. Governments will fail. There will be wars. There will be shortages. There will be famines. The Bible predicts all of these things. 
And it's nothing that you and I need to be uh, scared about. But we do need to be developing and practicing that relationship with God where we understand how He works and how He flows. And one of the best things you can do for yourself in terms of managing your finances is to learn heaven's economy. Learn how heaven's economics works because God's way of handling finances is totally opposite. In fact, everything God does is the opposite to what the world... The world will say, seeing is believing. You've heard people say, you know, I, 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 I won't believe it unless I see it. That's what the world says. God says you'll never see it unless you believe it. It's totally the opposite. The world says look after yourself. Put yourself first. Look after number one. God says the first will be last. And so there's, there's all, of, you know, everything in the kingdom of heaven works totally the opposite. And, that it, you know, because the devil's trying to, He's trying to counterfeit what God does. God's the original. The devil's the counterfeit. And the devil can't do it the way Jesus does it. So he's got to twist it and turn it around. And when it comes to finances, eh, the, world's, the world's approach to economics is totally different. You know, th there's two ways that you can really make your way financially. Through your own effort, that's the first way. So that's called human endeavor. You do some hard work. You apply some diligence, some dedication. And there's nothing wrong with hard work, diligence, and dedication. You can do some things and you can achieve some things with hard work, diligence, and dedication. But then the enemy comes in and he twists it and corrupts it. And so it's often influenced by this Babylonian mindset, a mindset that says, look after yourself first. No one else is going to look out for you. You want that promotion? Make sure you step on those that get in your way because otherwise you'll never get promoted. And so that's the Babylonian way of thinking. It's like it, that's the Babylonian way of thinking is people that say, well, I'm a self-made man. I'm a self-made woman. That's, that's totally corrupt. That's not the way the kingdom of, of God works, where you're thinking about looking after number one. The other way of doing it, like so human endeavor is one way of making it, but another way of handling your finances is through heaven's economy, the kingdom of God. It's being led by the Spirit and inspired by the Lord. You don't think God has ways of making you rich? You don't think God has ways? You think He's run out of ways? You think He's looking at you going like, how much do you need? Well, I didn't know you needed that much. You know, and, and here's the good news. Your prosperity is not dependent on your level of education. In the world it is, but if you decide to do it God's way, it is not dependent on your level of education, on how many letters you've got behind your name or what school you went to. Your prosperity is not dependent on which side of the freeway or which side of the tracks you were born. Your prosperity is not dependent on the sort of job that you have, on what the pay is. You can prosper getting minimum wages from your job just because you are exactly where God wants you to be. I love that. When God began to open my eyes to this a number of years ago, it was, that was good news to me. And you know what? I'm here to tell you it works. It works. It worketh, and it worketh well. It, you know, and so he heaven's economy and learning to flow, allowing the Spirit of God to teach you, allowing God's favor to open doors of opportunity instead of you trying to barge it and force your way and manipulate people to get your way. Heaven's economy is looking for the kairos moments, understanding that He already favors you. And so you look for where the favor is and the doors open and you walk into it. And people will go, how did you do that? And you'll just say, it's just God. You can't take credit because it's His favor. It's not because of your smarts. Your smarts, trying to do it, your, you, you know, you can't. And there's people that have made, made a great success in terms of finances doing it themselves. But I'm, I'm here to tell you, right, what you can do in the world 
it doesn't even match up, doesn't even measure up to the level of blessing and prosperity God wants to pour into your life. He doesn't want to give you just 10%, 12% interest on your savings. He doesn't want to give you a 15% return on your investments. He is in talk, God talks in multiples, two, three, five, seven, thirty, sixty, hundred, and you can go beyond a hundredfold. You don't have to, you don't have to think hundredfold is the limit. But you've got to change the way you think. We're preparing, the, the, we're preparing for the return of the king. And as your pastor, it's important for me to help you to recognize you can't operate the world's way in the, in the path that we're going, in what's ahead of us. There are some uncertain times coming ahead of us. Not uncertain for Jesus. He's not, his palms aren't sweating in heaven going, man, I hope we make it. He's not. He's not breaking out in a sweat. But you'll break out in a sweat if you don't learn how to flow in heaven's economics. And so anyway, I've just scratched the surface. But that's just some things for you to start understanding. Change the way you think. Don't think with that Babylonian mindset where it's just the Babylonian mindset is so self-consumed, so self-centered. The Babylonian mindset is tight-fisted. It cannot be generous. Whereas the kingdom of God, one of the earmarks of the kingdom of God is generosity, is open-handedness. Hallelujah. You know, a person who's kingdom-minded is a person, you know, like it, it, in, in the Babylonian system, it's like everybody's clawing to get to the top. And when they get to the top, they want to club everybody away because I'm on top. That's the Babylonian. Whereas in the kingdom of God, it's totally different. It's like there's plenty of room at the top and you can help others to get up to the top as well because you just realize there's plenty of room. We can all prosper. Did you notice when, the, when, when Jesus fed the multitude, everybody got it. Everybody got some. Jesus didn't say, listen, I've only got enough for you, for you disciples. That's it. Just, yeah, Philip, you're right. Let's just send all the others away, right? I'll, I'll see if I can do some hocus pocus on this little boy's lunch and we'll, we'll have some fish and chips for us and everybody else can find their own. No, there was plenty. Do You don't think on that day when he fed the multitudes, there would have been skeptics in that audience, in that congregation, in that multitudes. There would have been people who questioned well, I don't know what this is about. I'll just go and have a look, but I don't know. They still got to feed as much as anybody else because the whole kingdom of God operates like that. There's plenty of room. Come on, we can all prosper. That's the kingdom of God's way. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, I'm going to pray, and uh, if you would like to give, look, there's no, there's no obligation here to give. I want you to give because you see it in the Word of God. Not because I'm telling you, not because you feel a compulsion, but you see it in the Word of God. That's the first thing you need to do, is if you're going to step in this direction, look at what the Word has to say and then submit to the Word of God. That's true humility, submitting to what God has to say. So you are always welcome here. If you never give, you're always welcome here. I want you to learn how to do this God's way. Do I hear an amen? amen? Let's stand up. I'm going to pray. And if you would like to give, you, uh, you can come out after I pray. Lord, we're just so grateful. We're so grateful for how you do things. So grateful that as we move towards this future and the days that are ahead, that even though there's uncertainty in governments and uncertainty in uh, the economies of the world, there is certainty in heaven. You are not moved. You're not shaken. And there's plenty to go around. And so, Lord, we, we present our tithes and offerings. We present it to you to say thank you. We recognize, God, you're our source. In Jesus' name, amen. Come forward and give if you would like to.
Praise the Lord. Amen. So we're going we're gonna to gather around the communion table, and Audrey, I believe we're, we're handing over to you. Morning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, where do I even begin? There's this song that um, I heard years ago, and I like to sing it absent mindedly. So, some maybe a few months ago, I was singing this song says, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm only moved by the word of God. So I was seeing it as usual. And, and then this thought came to me. What does that mean? What does it mean to be moved? And at first, I was like I was having this conversation with myself, like with someone. <laughs> and I'm going, well, of course I know what it means to be moved. And then I was like, yeah, well, explain it. Then I started thinking about it. Well, if I had to explain it to someone, how would I explain it? What does it mean to be moved? So I went to the Bible and searched where the word moved is used. And, and then I went to Google as well. And this is what uh, I found. To be moved, to waver, to be disturbed, to be perturbed, anxious, upset, unsettled. So, like, so what does that, how does this apply to me? And um, so there's this one verse in Romans 4.20 where it talks about Abraham. Uh, Romans 4 verse 20. No. No, I've got the wrong verse. Oh, it says Abraham um, did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. Remember the first uh, descriptive word there is waver. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. Uh, and if you go on the King James Version, the King James Version says he did not stagger. And so I started thinking about that word stagger. What does it mean to stagger? Have you ever seen a drunk person walk? They go forward, backwards, sideways, round and round. How long does it take them to get to where they are going? Forever. That is, if they do get there. Have you ever seen a drunk person sleeping on the side of the road? What happened? They went round, they went forward, they went backwards until they were so confused and exhausted, and they were like, I'm just going to crush here for now. So that got me thinking, like, so what has that got to do with me? The um, second, the next verse after that says, Abraham fully trusted God. He was fully persuaded that... Thank you. That the go uh, he who had promised was faithful to bring it to pass. So to me, that means he he was he was a hundred percent persuaded. And I started looking at myself, like, am I a hundred percent persuaded, or am I ninety-eight percent persuaded, or eighty percent persuaded in some areas? Why was he fully persuaded? Because he trusted God. How do you get to trust someone? He had a relationship with God. He knew his father. He knew that the one who has promised is going to bring it to pass. Um, I was like, so does that mean I don't trust God? Why do I, don't I trust God if I don't trust God? Because I thought I trusted God. But I think God started showing me that I have got my, I'm looking at the wrong thing. 
I'm looking at myself, I'm trusting in my own self because sometimes I'm like up there going, I've got this, I'm going to fight you, devil. You are a dead man. And I've, you know, there's nothing you can do to me. I'm a winner, blah, blah. And then the next thing, maybe the symptoms get worse, or I get a bad report, or something is not going well with my finances, or whatever else. And then I start going, but God, how long is it going to take? I'm done with this. I'm, I'm fed up with this. You know, when are you going to come through, through for me? Moved, wavering, disturbed, perturbed. So, <coughs> what I learned from this whole thing was I need to get my eyes off me because I'm trusting in my own effort. I'm trusting in my own strength to go, I can fight you, devil. You have no chance. But there is a limit to what I can do. And my emotions, they go, they see so. But if I know God, it, then I should be putting my attention on him and going, God, you, are, you love me. And I'm going to trust in your love. I'm going to trust in what you've already done. I'm going to trust in my relationship with you that of course he's going to do it for me because he loves me. It's not like, God, can you please? But yeah, why not? Because he's my father. He loves me and he is God. I'm the apple of his eye. So why not? So taking, I, I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what you've been praying about. I don't know what's been going on in your life for weeks, for years or whatever. But my encouragement to you from what I've learned from this is maybe it's time to just go back to what is my really, who am I in this relationship with? This is about me and my father. I have a father and my father loves me so much. And he actually wants this more than I want it. And he wants to help me to get to the other side. But it's only when I focus on him. And when I fall, I'm like, because I used to feel like, Oh, I haven't prayed enough. Oh, I haven't done this enough. But when it's about relationship, I'm um, like, because if you are a kid, when you go to your parent, you don't like, you don't start to think, oh, did I wash the dishes? Did I do that? Am I going to get fed today? And start ticking off boxes. You just go, oh, I'm hungry. Or just go open the fridge, you know. Um, so that's my encouragement to you. So I'm going to pray and then we will take communion. Father, thank you. Thank you that we are loved by you and that you are not shaken by anything. You are steadfast, your love is sure, it is immovable, it is unchanging. So Lord, today we just thank you that whatever we have, whatever we get from you is from relationship and nothing else. And Father, we ask that you will remind us by your spirit, wherever we are, whatever we're going through, just to turn back and come back from whatever we've been doing and go back to relationship with you. Thank you, Father, that you never give up on us and that your love is unending. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Well, we've got a couple of announcements. Andrew, could you put the PowerPoint up for us, please? Hallelujah. Amen. So tonight is the testimony in Tucker night. What time... Yeah, amen. Praise the Lord. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be a lot of fun. What time does it start? 5 p.m. What time do you need to be here? 4.45. Yeah, be here by 
Uh, that just gives us a little bit of time to like bring, you know, bring a meal to share. It'll give us time to get that all organised and also that we can be there to welcome uh, guests that maybe you've invited that are going to be here or other guests uh, from others that, that have been invited as well. So that's going to be awesome. We're going to have a lot of fun tonight and um, hey, you know, it's, it's not too late to invite someone. If you Remember if you invite someone, make sure that you've cooked enough uh, for yourself as well as for them as well and we'll just share all the food. Praise the Lord. That's, that's all good. Um, after the service today, we're going to do a little bit of rearranging just to prepare for tonight. We'll tell you a little bit about that. But we don't want you to rush off. Please hang around and have a cuppa. We, we, we'll get you to help us just do a little bit of rearranging in terms of the seats. But uh, we're not trying to shoo you out, okay? So hang around and we'll have a cuppa after that as well. All right. Uh, what's the other one? There you go. Uh, I want you to note this in your diary, How to Lead Others to Christ. It's our training, evangelism training seminar on Saturday, August the 13th. It's, a, it's an all-day thing. Uh, bring some lunch to share. You know, the greatest thing that you can ever do for someone else is to share Jesus with them. You think about it this way. What's the greatest thing that ever happened to you? There's nothing greater than the day you became a child of God. Nothing greater because all of a sudden you turned, your destiny was changed from going to hell to going to heaven. Your name was written in the Lamb's book of life. So if that's the greatest thing that could ever happen to you, that, the next greatest thing has to be that you can help someone else discover that. And so this is a great thing for you to invest. You know, I've, I've found that people who are unable to share their faith effectively with others, um, uh, are unable to do it for one of two reasons. There's only two reasons that I, uh, that I found that stop someone being effective in, in leading others to Christ. The first is they're not living a victorious life themselves. It's not much of an advertisement if your life is falling apart and you're trying to say, hey, you know, like God can do that for you as well. That doesn't motivate anybody, right? And we address that every Sunday at church. We share different aspects of how you can live in victory in Christ so that you can share with others. So well, that's one reason is, is they're not living in victory themselves. But another, there's another reason why people are unable to lead others to Christ is they don't know how to. And, and so that's what Saturday is about. That's what August the 13th is about. We're not teaching you on August the 13th how to live in victory. We do that every Sunday. But we want to focus on that whole day to teach you how you can present the gospel in a few short minutes and how to keep the conversation on track. This is just from my personal experience. The things that, that, that we're going to be sharing with you are things that I've found have worked very effectively in my life. And so to keep people on track, keep the conversation on track, stop it getting sidetracked. I don't know if you've ever tried to share your faith with someone, but it's often it can get sidetracked. People go, oh, well, what about all the suffering? You know, if there is a God, why is that happening? Or, well, what about evolution? You know, like, I mean, if, if, if evolution's true, how can you say that God's real? And all of these things, and it's not to say that those things aren't important in their place. And I know with the creation evolution debate, that's how I came to Christ. Yet I found in my, in my own experience and in my life that that is very, very rarely a genuine question, that there's, there's much more effective ways of sharing your faith. And, uh, and I've seen the fruit of it in my own life as well. And so that's what we want to do that day is we want to show you how you can present the gospel in a few minutes, how you can keep the com conversation on point so it doesn't get sidetracked, how you can bring a person to a place of decision. And because it's our desire to see everyone experience the great joy of leading others to Christ, and especially as we're preparing for the return of the King. We want to bring people into the kingdom before He returns. Do I hear an amen? So that is on Saturday, August 13th, and I'll give you more details as we get closer. Praise the Lord. All right, do we have any God stories? Yeah, there's going to be some awesome God stories. We've already got a number of people that we've approached with God stories for tonight, and, uh, and it's going to be awesome. Um, so on Thursday, I started getting some flu symptoms 
and it was getting progressively worse um, through the night. And so Joel and I, we prayed and we were speaking over it and just commanding my body to um, be restored. And we, like by faith, we said um, overnight my body is like going to be healed and I'm going to be all good on Friday because I didn't want to take the day off work. Um, and when I woke up in the morning, I was really, I felt really well. Yeah, so praise God for his healing. Praise the Lord. Even though you didn't eat all those salt and pepper calamari, it's all right. She had a huge plate of salt and pepper calamari and she didn't eat them. Um, this is just a quick one. Just um, last Friday was 30 years since I was born again, since I gave my heart to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, so I have this, um, I've got two gardens and one on one side of the road, uh, driveway and the other, you know, obviously on each side of the driveway. Okay, so <laughs> we've got that established. Now in those gardens I've got one uh, on in each one rose bush, which I only just planted and the rest is all bare. And it made my heart sad that it was all bare and I said to my husband, give me some money, I need to go and buy some plants. He says, I've got no money. Okay. So about a month later, I go, well, yesterday, I went into the hardware store and I had $5. So I went and bought myself a punnet of strawberries. Yes, no, not strawberries, flowers. <laughs> Little punnet, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got strawberries on the brain. Um, punnet of flowers, and that was all fine and dandy. Went up there, very proud of myself, big smile on my face, put them on the counter, and I said, my husband will pay for those because he was out the other side. So I decided I'd just sneaky do that. And she said, would you like some more? They need some love. Would you like to have some? I said, well, I won't say no. So she took me out and she gave me like a whole row of punnets that were kind of, you know, just a little bit no good. And she said, you can have those. Thank you very much. Awesome. I said, praise God. Praise the Lord. Uh, I have two. They're about 45 minutes long. So no. um, the first one. Yeah, <laughs> the first one, um, historically, my ears are quite sensitive, and when I try to clean them, they uh, swell up and they swell closed, and I get ear infections, and it really hurts, and it gets makes me sick, and I lose my balance, and I usually have to take a few days off work. It's very bad. I don't like it. But for a few years, I've learned how to be on top of it, and I forgot to do the process during the whole moving kind of section of this year, and so it happened, my ears started to get blocked, and I'm thinking, oh no. So I, I did the wisest thing I could do, and I tried to clean it, and it swelled shut, and it got blocked. And I, I felt the infection start. I felt like really sick, uh, headaches, really severe loss of balance, and like felt like I was going to throw up. I tackled this all night. I was speaking to it on uh, Wednesday night. Up until four in the morning, I didn't sleep at all. And I got to be up at six to go to work. And um, I always just said, no, this is not going to, I'm not going to allow this in Jesus' name to rob my sleep or my health. Like, I'm not going to allow it no matter how I'm feeling. And then I've fallen asleep at yeah, four. I wake up at six. I completely forgot that I didn't, that I only had two hours sleep. Um, I was speaking restfulness over myself and I wake up and I was completely rested. I just went to work like it was a normal day. Uh, I completely forgot that I had an ear infection the night before. My ear was completely better. Um, I, I didn't even need to compensate sleep. I just... I, haven't, I still haven't like gone back and yeah, I've just, God just provided me the rest I needed in two hours. Um, so that was really awesome. Um, number two, at work, we have a mailman that comes and picks up the mail. Um, and so I met him in February or January and I kind of tried, because we're a Christian workplace, I tried, would, you could try to talk to him about things of God and he was completely put off. He came in with walls up, didn't want to hear it. I thought, all right, I respect that. And I said to God, I'm going to crack, you're going to help me. I want to crack this guy open. I'm going to minister to him. God said, all right, start developing a relationship. So over the course of six months, he would come in two or three times a week and we would just talk about secular stuff. You know, just like um, he was really interested in the Johnny Depp trial. And so I used that as a tool to engage with this guy. And he got really excited to talk with me about it. And then, um, we just moved on there and just developed a relationship. And then um, last week on Friday, he came up. 
and he took the mail, and I always walk him down every time he'd come, I'd walk him down to his van and just have a quick chat, five, ten minute chat afterwards. And he put the box down, and he said, yeah, um, I don't know why, but I feel like I need to tell you that I have a scan coming up for my throat at a specialist. He had to go get a specialist to get, like, look at his throat. He said, and I'm really nervous about it. And he goes, I don't know why, I just felt like I need to tell you. This guy's name's Sean. I just, we had a relationship, right? So I said to Sean, well, I'm going to pray for you, man. I said, that might feel, you might feel awkward about that, but I want to pray. And he said, yeah, I'm open to it. He goes, go for it. So I prayed. I just um, spoke health into his throat and I spoke life into it. I said, uh, um, how do you, like, when you go to the scan, I said, God's provided you doctors and specialists. I said, but don't let them talk mortality into you, man. I said, you're healed because that lines up with the word of God. We spoke to it. It has to come into line. And he went, all right. Yep. And I spoke with him um, this Tuesday, Tuesday that just passed. I said, hey, how'd you, how did your um, scan go? And he goes, yeah. He goes, I might cancel the specialist because since Friday, it's just gotten way better and it just keeps getting better and better. And he's like, I think it might be that Jesus stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, I might throw out the medicine they gave me. I said, no, don't, don't throw out the medicine, man. I said, God's provided you the counsel of doctors. You use it. It's just not the final say in how you're going. And then I get to talk to him more about the things of God. I got to share with him my back because I got restored my back. Mike is uh, going through some healing at the moment. I got to talk to him about that. And he was like all, all ears and all like eyes wide open. He just wanted to hear more and more. And eventually time took us away because he has other deliveries to do. Um, but yeah, I just praise God that you walk in, um, walk in his wisdom and he'll help you break down the walls. Like he didn't want to hear a bar of it in January. He wasn't interested at all. You bring up Jesus and he was just like, oh, you know. But now he's just like, tell me more, like, what else? Like, he, it's just so different for him. So, yeah, I just praise God for that opportunity and to continue to grow that seed. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. Joel's running off that Jesus juice that starts lawnmowers. <laughs> um, I just wanted to share something quickly. Um, so we were going to, down to Bunnings doing some gardening. It's a really awesome time to get in the garden. You might convert, Les. <laughs> um, yeah we went down to Buddy's to get some stuff and um there was a man there like uh shopping around behind us and I was looking at like the bush tucker section and I'm like oh like I don't know some of the stuff was labeled bush tucker I haven't really gotten into it but um they had like fancy labels on them and stuff and I'm like oh that's just like this and that's just that I'm like wonder why they call it bush tucker but obviously it's something people can go to anyway I saw this lily pilly there it's like a little fruit that kind of tastes like apple and they got a really big variety of it and he's got some really good tasty stuff at her house pick some off her trees when you go um, i'm sure she won't mind <laughs> yeah anyway um he, they had this big big one there and i'm like oh whoa there's lily pilly i'm like hang on it's labeled as bush truck i'm like oh it's like got a fancy name or something and it just made the guy behind us pipe up and then he's like he's like oh yeah that's um lily pilly blah blah, blah. and he keeps talking and i'm like whoa this guy really loves to talk and if any of you know me, I love to talk. But I also know where to stay quiet. But um, he loved to talk. He kept talking and talking and talking and talking all about his garden. And it turned out like he'd moved from Brisbane out our way um, a year ago. And there's, we've actually found a lot, a lot, a lot of people that have moved from Brisbane out our way to get acreage. And they want to start their own stuff and probably cause everything going on. And, um, and yeah, he, him and his wife had done that about a year ago and they'd gone hard out. They had 20 acres and then they decided to plant all these plants. And so even the most unusual plants, he'd heard of them. He wanted to plant all this stuff. And um, I had just met up with Andrew's uncle, the one who gave the, um, the um, chaplain to a sword from Andrew Womack book to. And he, um, Andrew's uncle, had given me this stuff called Yukon. It's like a root vegetable. It tastes a bit like carrot apple mix. And... Um, it's really different, but it, it tastes really nice. So eat it by itself, we cook it up or whatever. And I had some at home and I had like a root um, of that plant. They just plant it in the ground, break pieces off and grow it. And um, I had two pieces to eat like straight away. So it was, there was two bits to eat and there was this one big root. And anyway, he was talking and talking about all this stuff. And I mentioned to him about the Yukon and, and I hadn't told him I'd just gotten some. But um, he says, oh, yeah. He said, oh, yeah, that stuff's really good. And um, I didn't think he had it. So Andrew wanted to get back and finish chicken tractors at home. And he was kind of like, 
he's like, I'm going to the shop for one thing and I pestered him to come and then I came and the one thing turned into a half an hour conversation with a guy and Andrew's like, yep, my one thing's taken half an hour. So I raced back to drop Andrew off, zap my coffee, got a hot coffee, grabbed my Yukon and I raced down and I'm standing there. I'm like, Lord, you put it on my heart to give him some of this Yukon. Where is he? And he's like, stay there. And I'm like, okay. So I look around and he's like, look around the car park. And I looked around and there he is like down the end of the car park, putting stuff in his car. He's literally about to get in the car. And I called out to him and he turned around. He's looking at me like, what? And um, I raced up to him and I said, oh, I got you some Yukon. And he's like, oh, that's awesome. Thanks. And he got in the car and then Andrew said, oh, um, Andrew said, when I got back home, well, did he say much? And I said, no. But um, he invited us to like his Facebook page when we were um, at um, Bunnings. We told him about the chicken tractors. The Lord told me to mention that. And um, he had this homestead thing. And on the homestead at the um at the top of the page it says we put our trust and faith in god and i was like whoa like he believes in the lord too anyway um he got in contact with me through that page privately and he just said um i just wanted to message you Whew. i just wanted to message you because um he said i got back home and i told my wife we have actually looked everywhere to try to source this yukon and everything is out of stock and there's a wait list they've been trying for ages to try and get this and I just happened to have extra and I raced back to Bunnings to give it to them and they were just blown away. And um, so they were so excited. They put it on their Facebook page saying, hey, those random people we met at Bunnings, you gave us some Yukon, you know, come over to our house and we'll introduce you to everything. And so we went over to their house and shared a meal with them. Actually, two, we stayed for dinner and lunch and um, they showed us their land and all the stuff that they had and we just saw how much variety they had and, and that one Yukon that they didn't have. And she's like, they were just blown away. And I'm like, see, God cares about the little things, like the little duck, you know, that Artie wanted before. And um, that really blessed us. So um, they were really excited about that. And they've been able to bless us, telling us some of the stuff that they're doing. And they came over to our house again recently. So, yeah, God set up a connection out our way, which is really cool. It really blessed us. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. Hey, hey isn't it good to have the Eddies back? Um, I've got 437 photos I want to show you. No, no, not really. We had such an awesome trip. It was really great. Three weeks uh, wasn't long enough. So I've got two quick testimonies. First one, we went to um, down to Mount Hotham for a ski trip and uh, a bit of a road trip. And on the way, we stopped in at Sydney. Now, um, I'm not the best with directions, uh, but we got to a place in Sydney, uh, our accommodation, and apparently it was a little bit of a seedy place little bit you don't sort of go walking by yourself and anyway we found a place to eat and oh, Zoe came with us too that was a real blessing and um, we found this place to eat and the meals were huge really really great big meals and um, we had our meal and we're sitting down and uh, once we'd finished that and Ben finished off everybody else's meals um, we said really God just really spoke to me about I never say this but I said okay everyone let's go make sure you got everything we're going back to the the unit Make sure you got all your gear. And I thought, oh. I, I was even sort of shocked that I even said this. I was like the father, the dad. Make sure you got all the stuff, kids. Packed into the car and off we went using my GPS to get all the way back through Sydney, Rat Run, to where we were staying, about 20 minutes drive. Got back home, unpacking everything, and then Jules said something. Where's my purse? <laughs> Have you seen my bag? Where's my bag? And I went... I don't know, is it here under the bed? We kick it under the bed? No, no, where's my bag? Where's my bag? My bag? I said, did you take it to the restaurant with us? She goes, oh, I don't know. I think so. I'm thinking, oh, man. You know, when you lose your wallet, your guts just go, oh. We were, oh, we're on the way to our holiday. And all the credit cards are in there and everything. I said, Jules, check the car. So we went down and checked the car and it was freezing cold outside. And I was already in my pajamas. <laughs> oh, went into the boys' room. Have you got mum's bag? No. Got back in the car. And, oh. Give me the car. Come on, Jules, let's go. I'll put my clothes back on again. And I got there in warp speed. Didn't even use the GPS. You would have been proud of me. Well, I read the rap run. Got all the way. And I'm praying in tongues all the way. And I think, no, I'm not going to stress about this. I'm not going to stress. Got there, closed. Yeah. <laughs> this place is closed. It's in a tavern. And I'm thinking, oh, man, all these people that we've been drinking are coming out of the other side of the tavern and pulled in. I'm thinking, no, nope, God, you got this. You got this. Got out of the car and we were stomping away over to the, the front. 
And in the distance, I saw the waitress that served us was walking to her car. And I went, excuse me, excuse me. I said, do you remember me? And she goes, oh, yeah, I remember you. I went, oh, look, my wife, I think we've left her handbag inside. And she went, oh, oh, okay. Well, come on, let's go. And she opened back up and we walked all the way back inside and there it was, tucked underneath the... So there's a God story, you know. This is Sydney, a bunch of thieves. They stole the first state of origin. They couldn't steal my wife's bag, no way. The second one... um, it was on our way back. We'd done our ski trip and on our way back we stopped in a, a little place. Uh, we wanted to sort of see a lot of country in New South Wales. And of course, you all heard about the rain and the flooding in New South Wales. Yep. Um, and we, we had plans to go around and see lots of different stuff. And um, we stopped at a little place called Oberon. And um, we thought, oh, well, because of the rain, you know, maybe we should just head up towards the coast more. And um, so we were just, we weren't even planning our accommodation. Every day we'd sort of ring ahead to try and see if we could get lucky. And uh, we we went through a place called Windsor, was it, Ben? Yep. And uh, the lady there said, oh, yeah, the last floods, it went up over our bridge, which is supposed to be unfloodable. And she said, oh, look in the trees. You can see where logs are in the trees. And we thought, oh, wow, okay, well, I hope that doesn't happen again. Well, guess what? The next day it happened there. It was up over the bridge. So we escaped that. And we found accommodation in Port Macquarie, uh, that weekend at one of the resorts that we have, which should have been booked out because of school holidays, we got a brand new, brand new unit. It was, you missed out. <laughs> it was awesome for that much, for two nights. And God just blessed us, you know, so many different times throughout this whole holidays. And if you've got a spare four hours, I'll share you those photos with you. Um, so, but God is good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Man, and didn't we miss this one <laughs> and her bright, cheerful oh. countenance? <laughs> Hello, beautiful people. Um, I went on holidays with the Edwards and it was the best time. It was absolutely blessed. Um, we weren't able just to see snow, but we were able to see it snowing and it was gorgeous. And um, it was just so awesome to spend time with the family and building the relationship and it was just awesome um also on the flight home i was just thinking to myself i'm like it would be so cool if i was to sit next to the window but i it didn't really bother me it was just a thought and i sat near the window and it was awesome <laughs> <laughs> hallelujah praise the lord hey why don't you get up go and high five someone and tell them you are destined to win
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Find a seat, folks. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, you are... Praise God. So we are in for a treat this morning. Uh, Pastor Verena is going to be ministering, and she has an awesome word from the Lord. Let's stand up and honor the Word of God and the woman of God. Thanks so much, family. Be seated. I'm so excited. You know, when the Lord walks before you, it's just the best, isn't it? Like all morning, you know, when Pete was sharing and then Kathy was sharing and Audrey was sharing and different ones of you, you know, it just... The Lord is just so good, hi. He just confirms, you know, he gave me a word for us this morning. And I was like, Lord, wow. You know, you will find out in a second what it is. So it's, um, yeah, it's a good word, but it's also a challenging word. So what I've, I've been hearing this morning and uh, what I'm saying, why he's going before us is, he says, eyes of people, eyes of yourself, Trust me. Fear me, and you will be right. You will be safe. So he's given me a scripture this morning. Um, well, not this morning, in preparation for this morning. And um, I think um, you're familiar with this one. It's uh, Proverbs 29, 25, if you want to open your Bibles. Um, the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Thanks, Andrew. <coughs> so we want to stir ourselves up, right? In times like this, we've got to stir ourselves up. We've got to know where we are standing. We, we've got to know who we are with and who we are trusting. We've got to know it. You heard um, Pastor Les preach on different things that are going on in the world, and you're all very aware because of things that are going on in your own lives and things that are going through the media currently. And uh, you all have the discernment knowing the time is near. He's coming. It very much looks like we as a generation to see our king appearing in the clouds, you know, to some people that is like, wow, that's a good story, hey. But no, we know that is going to happen. And we will be there, we will see it, and we will be taken up in midair. Man, we are in for, you know, forget action movies, really. I mean, that would be just awesome, won't it? Um, yeah, so I have... Um, just looked up um, different versions here, and uh, they're on the screen. So if you want to um, read them with me, I just really bring want to bring home um, the point here um, that the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. So the New Living Translation says, Fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting the Lord means safety. Which one? Oh, okay. I should click so you get to see the next one. The other one? No? Click again. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting the Lord means safety. There's another translation here called The Voice. I don't know if some of you have read The Voice before. Um, I quite like it to, to look it up every now and then. If you fear other people, you're walking into a dangerous trap. But if you trust in the eternal, you will be safe. The message translation says, the fear of human opinion disables trusting in God protects you from that. 
and the good news translation says it is a it is dangerous to be concerned with what others think of you but if you trust the lord you are safe isn't that something we can relate to you know i think we all have been in a situation where it's like oh i don't know what other people will say or think of me um, but it says it is dangerous to be concerned with what others think of you. But if you trust in the Lord, you are safe. And here's one more that is um, the AMP, um, the Amplified uh, Classic, which says, The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever leans on, trusts in, and puts his confidence in the Lord is safe and set on high. So my first point is, when we fear man, it brings a snare. So what's a snare? Let's just have a, a quick look at um, the, the original word, a word that's been used here, which means by implication, a hook for the nose. To become ensnared or trapped, it can also mean nose. So what's a noose? A noose is a large loop at the end of a rope that gets smaller when you pull the rope and that is used to capture animals or to hang people. I think we, we all can see a picture there. Um, so it pets, puts you into a very difficult spot, let's just put it this way, right? Traps and snares are commonly used for animals. But Proverbs points out that the same is true for us. If we are afraid of people, we are walking into a dangerous trap. Fear of men will not only trap us, it will take our freedom away and it could even kill us. On top of that, we are the ones assisting to set that snare, to bring that snare. So keep that thought. When animals become aware of a trap or snare, they instinctly, instinctively run away, right? They don't want to be captured, and we must do the same. We ourselves must run to where we are safe. Living in fear is not safe. And if you take a second and just listen to yourself, you know if you have the peace that, su uh, that surpasses all understanding, if you can feel it right now, or is there you know, a feeling that points to fear? The fear of man, the fear of what people could say or do to us is a trap of the devil because fear is not of God. He's given us not a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind, right? God's perfect love casts out all fear. Satan wants to destroy us. He is a, uh, a thief who does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. Yes, hallelujah. And we have been given a choice. We can avoid being trapped. Remember, we can assist in bringing on that snare, but we can also resist and not assist. So it's up to us if we experience the abundant life, the life Jesus came to give us. And it's up to us to learn from God's word how to live victoriously and abundantly. So let me just talk a little bit more about fear is what brings the snare. I really just want to drill it down a little bit so that we all um, get, a, get a hold of this because you, as you will see, as my message develops, it's really important to us. So the original uh, meaning of the word that's, that's being used here means fear, anxiety, care, or trembling.
So if it is fear that brings a snare and has the potential to give, give Satan an inroad into our lives to steal from us, to kill and to destroy, we need to understand how fear operates, right? We want to know how does it work? What do I have to watch out for so I can make sure I don't assist, like, you know, give in to fear? So why do we fear men? How does fear of men manifest? What are symptoms in a person? Why does fear bring a snare? What do we need to do so we can start living free of fear? And as we look at the fear of men, we will also consider the fear of God. So these are just a few questions. You know, we could, there would be other questions, but I just wanted to narrow it down a little so that we get um, the point across. <coughs> so fear of men can uh, manifest physically and emotionally, but it's always spiritual of its nature. Let's just have a look at physical fear of men first. If a person feels threatened by another person who has the power to physically harm or kill them, it naturally causes that person to fear the other, right? However, this is usually caused by a specific person. So we are talking about the physical fear here that's caused by a specific person and it's a very specific event. Physical symptoms of fear of men will represent themselves in outward actions that flow from the heart. How a person sees themselves is usually at the core. And I believe you all can relate to it. I can relate to that, you know. So it's really important. How do we see ourselves in our heart? And then when we look at another person, you know, it might cause fear. Hopefully it doesn't, you know. So I um, looked at the Old and New Testament just to, or mostly the Old actually, just to bring out a few examples to demo demonstrate how people physically feared for their lives. In Genesis 12:12 uh, 12, 12 and 20:11, we read about A Abraham. There's two accounts, and I believe you all know that, um, where um, Abraham um, basically lied. Well half light, let's put it this way, about his wife. I'll read it out to you. Because I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will kill me on account of my wife. So that was his reason why he lied about Sarah being his sister. Now, if you know your scriptures, you know that she sort of was his sister. So it's not, it was, you know... Um, a white lie, as they say, or just, you know, half lied, but he definitely did it to save himself, didn't he? I mean, that's, that's so. And even more so, um, Abraham did it a couple of times, and then his son Isaac, you know, followed right into his fo footsteps, you know, and he called Rebecca, his wife, also sister, when he was in a situation where he just feared, you know, uh, felt threatened, you know, by the people around him. So their reasoning was, surely the fear of God is not in this place. Here's another example for you that's from Exodus, and um, I think you're all familiar with this one too. It's Exodus 32, verses 22 to 24. So Aaron said, do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. So he's speaking to Moses here, because Moses, as you would remember, he went up the mountain to, um, to meet with God, and it took him a while to come back. And so in the meantime, Aaron was there with the Israelites, you know, and did his own thing. They um, didn't think he would be coming back. So eventually Moses came back, and so this is what Aaron said to him. Do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. You know the people, they are set, uh, they are set on evil. For they said to me, Make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And I said to them, Whoever has any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me, and I cast it into the fire. And this 
calf came out. Wow. Talk about miracles. I just throw some gold in the fire, you know, and the calf comes out. Yeah. Good one, Erin. But, um, yeah, anyway, uh, why did he say that? Why, you know, what was his point? Why well, he thought, you know, these people, their hearts are set on evil. You know, I better do something, you know, that will appease them, you know, and please them. So that's what he did. Um, and um, here's one other example. That's um, David, who was um, then anointed as uh, as the king, King David already, but he was still under Saul, so Saul was still on his throne. In 1 Samuel 27, 1, we read, And David said in his heart, Now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines, and Saul will despair of me to seek me any more in any part of Israel, so I shall escape out of his hand. So again, there was a man who physically, you know, feared for his life, and so did the others. You know, just there was a physical fear of people being around, and he f they feared them, thinking, well, if I don't do this, well, then I might lose my life here. <coughs> So notice that people often have a physical fear of another person or group of people because they sense the absence of the fear of God in them. Again, I think we can all relate to that. Sometimes you just perceive, man, these people here, they don't fear God. You know, you don't feel safe around them. So when they, instead of remembering who they are in God and that he is the one who protects and fights for them, fear people more than God, they start fearing for their life. Throughout the scriptures we observe that God's chosen people, the Jews, as well as the disciples of Christ, which we call ourselves as well, of course, physically feared others because those who did not have the fear of God in them wanted to kill them because of their herit heritage, because of who they are, who they were and who we are. What we now call persecution depicts the devil's fight against the children of God and this, as we all know, is happening since Adam and Eve. You can read that in the book of Genesis. Make no mistake, the devil is at war with us. And he uses people for his plans. But, and we read Ephesians 6.12, we read there, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. As God's children and disciples of Jesus, we need to remember that if we start giving in to fear, Satan surely will have an inroad in into our lives to kill, steal, and destroy. We literally give him permission to do so. Jesus said to his followers, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him after your, own, uh, after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Jesus was preparing his disciples for the physical persecution that would follow his resurrection. You all have read those accounts where we read, um, read more about that. They would be beaten, stoned, flogged, and imprisoned. Many of them would be killed. Jesus wa warns them not to let the fear of men stop them from proclaiming the, co the gospel. His followers later understood that even though they would undergo tremendous physical suffering, for his sake, the trials would only be temporary. The great rewards they reaped for their faithfulness will last forever. 
Forever they will live in the presence of their loving Heavenly Father. And so will we. Let's not give in to the fear of man. Let's not give the devil a foothold and assist him in bringing that snare. So th there is some deeper aspects of the fear of man. And I would like to, um, to look at those with you, just open it up for you a little bit more. So there is causes there. Why do people fear? We just spoke, uh, spoke about the physical fear, but again, there's deeper aspects here. Usually it's wrong thinking and believing that causes us to sin by putting man before God. And let's be clear, we don't want to hear that, but it's a sin if we put man before God. <laughs> you know, we sometimes, you know, walk through life and we kind of go, oh yeah, man, I need to change that. You know, but in the eyes of God, it's, you know, it's actually, you know, um, well, it's, it's sin and we know we are forgiven. But what does it mean? It means that it's actually... <laughs> Uh, not helping us to see the, uh, say the least, there's consequences to it. And the consequences, you know, um, are what, what make life very difficult, can make life very difficult for us. <coughs> we, yeah, so it's us. We choose to fear men and wh when we should fear God. And that's how we bring on the snare. Most Christians will be challenged by this at some stage in their journey, and we all need to deal with it. So let's just look at some symptoms. Some symptoms can be discouragement or lack of peace or ungratefulness, anxiety or envy. Fear of man is the anxious need to receive affirmation from other people. So I'm not talking about, you know, the, the, five love langu uh, the five love languages. One of them is affirmation. So <laughs> it's obviously a good thing as well. But if we depend on that, that's the problem. When we fear that more than fearing God and what he says about it, about us, that's, that's where the problem lies. It manifests, fear, uh, fear of men manifests as people-pleasing, compromised values, peer pressure, and a hesitation to share our faith. It becomes, becomes a snare, especially when we allow it to influence our decisions. Something is wrong if we choose to avoid unpleasant interactions with others. If we try to hide rather than obey the voice of the Holy Spirit who would give us wisdom, and show us how to act. Sometimes, you know, we really need to confront another person. That's a mature thing to do. The immature thing to do is to hide and to fear the other person, you know, could bring something on that has consequences we then have to deal with and we don't really want to deal with those consequences. You know, but if we do that all the time, well, that's then fear of men, and that is what brings on a snare, right? If we are giving in to fear instead of making mature decisions, it shows that we are still spiritually, uh, spiritually immature and lack a sense of identity. We need to grow up. And we all do. You know, there is no one who is perfect this side of heaven, you know. So we all need to take on a challenge and grow up. No one wants to feel rejected or get physically harmed. Yet even if it seems easier to heed the fear of men rather than inviting the possibility of consequences, we need to watch out and understand what it actually says about us. So if we choose to hide, if we choose, you know, some, you know, why to somewhat get around it, what does it say about us? What do we, we don't even have to broadcast that or talk to other people about it. It's just something that we need to see ourselves. We need to have the discernment. You know, where am I at with this, you know? Lord, help me, what, you know, what do I need to do, you know? Even more so, if we struggle in everyday life with this issue, 
what when real persecution comes our way? You know, these are like everyday issues that can come up where, where we feel challenged. You know, we will go, oh man, you know, here we go again. You know, but we need to embrace that challenge, you know, and go, okay, well, I've got to do something about this. You know, and the question, what if, what do I do, where do I stand, how do I face it when real persecution comes our way? And scripture says it will. What do we do then? Do we want to hide? Do we just, you know, want to find some cop out and just go, okay, well, someone else will say yes for me then? It's not easy. Don't think I've got all of that nailed down. You know, I'm presenting a challenge here to you which I have grappled with for years. I know where I stand, though. And, you know, I believe the Lord is putting that challenge before all of us today, you know. We need to make a decision here. The fear of man will become very dangerous when we allow it to tempt us to deny what we believe, believe in and who we belong to. That's the time when it could ensnare us in a way that it could cost us not just our physical lives, but our eternal lives as well. Jesus said, but whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. That's in Matthew 10.33. We must count the cost. Following Jesus, it will cost us. Some of us you know, have already experienced it when we're talking about vaccination you know, different things we went through the last couple of years. You know, some of you stood, you lost your job for that, and you, you know, you trusted that God will make the provision, and he has. We have heard some wonderful God stories, you know, where God came through, where he provided in every sense of the word. But you had to do the first step. It didn't just happen. It wasn't that someone else came along and said, oh, yeah, you will be right. You know, just, you know, no, you made a decision. And so as time goes on, following Jesus will cost us. Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 2. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Again, we are in great danger when we let the fear of men challenge the truth we believe in, and the convictions we have, when the need to be liked and accepted becomes more important than the word of God and the true gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the sin that can easily ensnare us but as we look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, we will be filled with joy. We also will endure. And every hardship that comes our way, we will endure. And we will continue in eternal glory. Thousands of martyrs could have avoided death had they remained silent about their loyalty to Christ. If they had allowed the fear of man to silence them, they might have won the world but lost their soul. I've got a testimony which I would like to read out to you. It's very compelling. And it is about a, an Egyptian regiment. Just give me a second, I'll get it up for you. There's some big words in here, so be patient with me. I will try my best German accent. How's that? <coughs> so the 
testimony is about the Roman um, Theban legion. In the year of Christ, 286, a most remarkable affair occurred. A legion of soldiers consisting of 6,666 men contained none but Christians. This legion was called the Theban Legion because the men were Egyptian Christian Copts who had been recruited from and stationed in Thebes in Upper Egypt. The Theban Legion was quartered in the east until the emperor Maximinian ordered them to march to Gaul to assist him against the rebels of Burgundy. It was the custom of the Romans to move troops from extreme parts of the empire to avoid the problem of Roman trained soldiers participating in uprising to free, the, uh, um, to free their native lands. The Theban legion passed through the Alps into Gaul, so we're talking about Switzerland here, under the command of Mauritius, Candidus and Exupernus, their worthy commanders, and at length joined the emperor. About this time, Maximian ordered a general sacrifice at which the whole army was to assist, and likewise he commanded that they should take the oath of allegiance and swear at the same time to assist in the extirpation of Christianity in Gaul. Alarmed at these orders, each individual of the Theban legion absolutely refused either to sacrifice or take the oath prescribed. This so greatly enraged Maximian that he ordered the legion to be decimated. That is, every tenth man to be selected from the rest and put to the sword. The names of the soldiers were written on papers and placed in the caps of the centurions, for 600 were destined to perish as examples. These embraced their comrades who encouraged them and even envied their fate. The plain soon followed with the blood of martyrs, flowed with the blood of martyrs, well, martyrs, sorry. So the plain soon flowed with the blood of martyrs. The survivors persisted in declaring themselves Christians, and the butchery began again. The blood of another 600 reddened the waters of the Rhone. The Rhone is a river. The second severity made no more impression than the first had done. The soldiers pres preserved their fortitude and their principles, but by the advice of their officers, they drew up a loyal rom uh, remonstrance to the emperor. This, it might have been presumed, would have softened the emperor, but it had a contra contrary effect. For enraged at their perseverance, he uh, commanded that the whole legion should be put to death, which was accordingly a executed by the other troops, who cut them to pieces with their swords. This happened in September, on September 22, in the year of 286. These men were ready to die for their convictions. They stood. Even more so, they, you know, they didn't just stand for themselves. They also stepped forward and said, let me take that spot. And all of them ended up being martyred. By God's grace, we may never face that choice personally, but we all need to consider what to do. Friends, we must set our heart 
so that no matter what happens, no matter what people say or do, we do not depend on that. We just don't depend on people. Know who you are, whom you believed, and who you belong to. We must stand. Consider the bold words Peter spoke when he and the other apostles were ordered to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. You remember that? Jesus went to heaven, and now all the apostles went forward. And God had sent Holy Spirit, so they had the power and the boldness in their hearts, and they were burning to go. And here is Peter. We all know Peter, the apostle Peter. So his words were... In, uh, in response, we must obey God rather than men. And that's what we read in Acts 5, 29. Peter learned his lesson. Remember how Peter denied Jesus the night before he was crucified? How bitterly he wept when Jesus had prophesied to him just hours earlier. And it came to pass, the rooster crowed. And he knew he had denied his Lord three times, and he bitterly wept. But G Jesus, you know, when he came back, he, um, he forgave him. He reinstated Peter. There was grace there. And there is grace for every one of us. Peter was one who was tempted to fear men rather, rather than God many times. But the grace of God restored him and empowered him to stand for what he believed, the gospel of Christ and his Savior and Lord Jesus. Was he perfect? No. Listen to this in Galatians. Paul wrote, Galatians 2.11, for prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat, this is uh, referring to Peter, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. So you can see that Paul, you know, even then, you know, had to stand him down. But we know the rest of Peter's life you know, he might have tripped up there, but the rest of Peter's life and how his life ended, he stood. He stood. By the grace of God, he stood. He did not let go of his convictions by the way he had done that, um, that first night. He stood till the end. The first disciples did not allow the fear of men to keep them from doing what God had called them to do. Neither should we. God will give us his grace when we ask him. If God is for us, who can be against us? God's approval and acceptance must be enough. We need to settle that in our hearts. It must be enough. If we know in our hearts that we are doing what God has told us to do, we don't feel a need to be validated and confirmed by other people. When we fear God only, nothing can stop us. But if, we fear, if the fear of punishment or rejection from people is greater, we will always be slaves and never be free to our true selves. And we would be the first to feel that, de that deep, deep disappointment. You know what it feels like. I'm sure you know. You know, when you're so disappointed with yourself and you know you should have done better. You know, God's grace is sufficient for us. We are not, you know, condemned for that, you know. But we, just like Peter, need to move on from there and... and Say, Lord, your grace, you know, forgives me, but it also empowers me. It empowers me to do what I know I need to do because I see it in your word. I hear your Holy Spirit. You're telling me 
what to do, and I am doing it. Only when we, when we make God's opinion about us the only thing that matters, can we overcome the fear of man. <coughs> the Apostle Paul was another good example of that, probably. I mean, yeah, I love the Apostle Paul. He just some awesome stuff um, we, we read. He died to selfish ambitions and longed for God's approval only. We read in Philippians um, 3, verses 8 to 10. And he boldly declared, Galatians 1.10, For I am, now, am I now seeking the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. People forsook him, yet he stood firm. Living was about Christ's approval. No fear of man could snare him. He was beaten unjustly and thrown into prison, prison, yet he was so content in the Lord that he sang praises at midnight. He just praised and got the whole prison saved. He ju um, if they threatened to kill him, he thanked them because to depart and be with Christ was far better in his opinion. He trusted God. When they released him, he went right back to proclaiming the gospel without fear of what they could do to him. Paul was, was free as only those who have their total trust in the Lord can be. And again, all of us, you know, have been through many situations. It doesn't just have to be this context. It can be just in every, everyday life things. You know, where you just knew, you know, this is what God says and this is how I go. And so then you've done it and man, how good does that feel, hey? You just, you know, you know, you trusted God. wasn't easy, but you did. So consider this, the same awesome spirit that li lived in Jesus and the Apostle Paul also lives in us. Holy Spirit, he lives in us. In Romans 8, 14 to 16, we read, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and have children and heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Let me tie it all together. If you look at the second part of, um, of that verse, going back to Proverbs, I just read the whole verse out again for you. The fear of man brings a snare. So that's what we've been looking at, at so far. But whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. So this second part of the verse tells us to trust God and his promises. And when we do, we will be safe. To trust God means to fear God. And not man. And that's really the point I wanted to bring home today. Fear God. Don't fear man. It was because Abraham thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place, that he lied about Sarah instead of trusting God. He feared people more than God. It was because Aaron feared the people that were set on evil, 
more than God, that he decided, let's make us gods that shall go before us. Aaron feared the people and their gods more than his God, the God of Israel. It was because David, David said in his heart, there's nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape. He feared Saul, a man, more than that he had trusted God would deliver him. It was because Peter had learned to fear God rather than man that he overcame. And his words were, we must obey God rather than man. That's an inspiration to us. Let, let it be an inspiration to us. And Paul said, For I am now, am I now seeking the approval of man or of God, or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. He trusted and feared God more than people. I pray that that is something you take home today. The fear of man brings a snare. But when we trust God, we are safe. Let me conclude with Proverbs, because uh, Proverbs 14, verses 26 to 27 draw it together nicely. In the fear of the Lord there is strong confidence and his children will have refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may avoid the snares of death. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Let's stand up. Hallelujah. Oh, let me encourage you just to um, uh, spend some time with God and meditate on these things. This is, I believe, a very timely word, particularly with where we're going uh, ahead of us. We want to ensure that we calibrate ourselves to put Jesus first in our life um, and not just bow to the wishes of of the opinions of, uh, of others, hey? Uh, if you would like uh, Pastor Verena or I to pray for you, whether it's to do with the message or something different, we would love to do that. Other than that, we're going to have some fellowship. We're going to do some rearranging. I'm going to get Pastor Phil to come out and he's going to explain. Please don't feel like you've got to rush